So the first thing I want to just start with is the first thing that we need to do when we come at this work is recognize that human beings were not designed to read. The brain does not learn just to read on its own. Reading must be explicitly taught. And when we are teaching a child to read, we are actually rewiring the brain and restructuring how the brain works. That's why it's hard. So I know you guys are familiar with the reading rope. We have talked about this um, before, and you guys have a lot of background knowledge on this, right? But that our goal is over here in a, well, a child that can read, that can do world, word recognition and comprehend the text. And this is where reading comprehension lands over here. But it requires these two skills, right? So the first, which is what we've been talking about, is the skill to lift words off the page, right? And that's what really what been our focus this year. But equally as important is language comprehension. And I want to point out it's language comprehension, not reading comprehension. So we need to build the language needed for reading. And then we put these together for reading comprehension, which falls over here. Okay. And so the science of reading is based on 30, 30 years of research, easily 30 years of research. And um, these are some of the ones that I'm pulling from today, but they're all excellent. Um, and basically the science of reading is a, a merging of research from many disciplines. So it's the cognitive scientists, you know, the ones that do brain scans, right? It's the educational researchers, it's the intervention researchers, it's so on. It's all these people coming together and they have all come together and basically say the same thing. We know how children learn how to read. So why does this matter? I actually, I love this image. It matters because if we look at all of the students that we teach, about 5% will learn to read and it will seem effortless. So I am one of these 5%, all right? I entered kindergarten reading, okay? Now, did I just learn it magically? No. I was lucky enough to have my neighbor who was four years old, and I'm still friends with her. She's like my adopted sister. She was, I think, four years older than me and was going to school, and she liked to play school. So she would lock me in the bedroom with her and make me play school with her. We even had our own little chalkboard and everything. And she was teaching me what her teachers were teaching her. So she taught me very explicitly how to read words. And um, so I entered kindergarten reading already because I had gone to school for two years prior <laughs> to kinder, getting all of that instruction with her. And when I got my doctorate, she took full credit for it. And I think she deserves it. So, but there's a small amount that will come in. It looks like easy as reading. Reading is easy, I'm sorry. And uh, about 35% will learn to read easily. So a total of 40% of our students will lead, learn to read easily. And when you look at your data at your school, I bet you have 40% that are just rocking it, right? They will probably read, it won't be that hard. And the method that you use matters, but it won't affect them as much, okay? But the structured literacy, which we talked about last time, the difference between structured and balanced, will accelerate it. So that's one of our questions right now is how do we accelerate? Well, that's one of the ways, right? 30 to 50% of our students need very explicit, systematic, and sequential phonics instruction and phonemic awareness. And then you're going to have about 10% that need more support. And though that's usually about how it lands within our schools. For these guys, though, down here, structured literacy is essential. So these guys, they probably would learn anyways. But these guys, if you don't, so we're talking 50 to 60% of our students, if we don't use it, probably will have issues with reading. So that's really why we're having this conversation. So how does the brain lift words off the page? As I said before, our brain is not wired to read, it's wired for speech. This is our first written language for the Phoenicians, and it is a sound-based system, just like English is. 
Um, Chinese is an exception. It is actually not, but most of the world languages are all phoneme or sound based. Okay. And because that's how our brains are wired, they're wired for speech. And so reading um, built from that. And so when we read, we actually use three parts of the brain. And basically this is the rewiring. We are creating these pathways and teaching the brain to work in a new way. So one part of the brain is seeing letter sequences, not whole words. The brain does not see whole words. It sees familiar letter sequences, okay? So we see C-A-T, and I'll get into this if we know what that is automatically, if it's been orthographically mapped, which I'll talk about in a minute, then we'll just say it's cat. If not, we have to put associate, when we're doing phonics, we then associate that symbol with the sound. So that is the point of the sound spelling card. So we see this C, we have a K, we put them together, we put K at cat, and that's the word, and then we have the part of the brain that gives us word meaning. So this is basically why reading is rooted in phonological processing and these phonemic awareness skills become so critical. And that sound symbol correspondence is so critical because that is actually how the brain reads. When we read, there's two different types of kind of word level reading that happen with us. And the first is phonics, which is what we've been talk about, talking about. So we have the skills to decode an unfamiliar word, right? So we see letters, we see a letter sequence, we associate those letters with the sound, right? Then we blend them, and then we are able to produce the word cat. And then we use the meaning, we know what a cat is, okay? The other aspect that we haven't talked that much about is actually something called orthographic mapping. And orthographic mapping is when we do that and the, the brain has done it enough times so that is automatic. And that is actually why we think we read by sight, but actually by sight words, but we actually don't. Because but when we orthographically mapped, the brain has memorized that letter sequence into a familiar pattern. And then it knows with automaticity that this word right here is reading. That word is orthographically mapped in your brain. So it goes really, really fast and with automaticity. And then it becomes a sight word. So as proficient readers, we have 50,000 or more orthographically mapped words in our brains, okay? But you are still never, the brain is never reading whole words. It's actually very quickly seeing C-A-T, says, I know C-A-T, that's cat, cat, and it's the word cat. And it does it really fast, so we aren't even aware of it. So let's see, let me give you an example. So I think you guys know I just came back from Hawaii a couple of days ago. And, you know, I'm always working even when I'm on vacation. And I started noticing a whole bunch of words that were not orthographically mapped in my brain. Words on the screen in these pictures are orthographically mapped for you. That means you read them with automaticity and you don't even have to think about it. Clean and freeway. Yep. <laughs> right? I mean, this is perfect. Like, this is an example. So this, these two words right here are orthographically mapped. We just read them. We know what they are. There's no hesitation. However, as I'm driving around Oahu, I was like, what's that word? And I noticed my brain slowing down and attempting to decode. So basically I was going back and forth between these two things. So most words for me are orthographically mapped, but when something is not, I go back to this. And so this is what we're teaching children in phonics. Our goal is that they orthographically map and don't need to use this but it's still a skill that we have when we need to slow down and figure out an unfamiliar word. So both become super critical. All right, so basically this is what's happening. You have the three parts you know, of the brain working together and it's putting the three sounds to get this, the sequence of letters connected to the sound, makes the word bed and we connect it with meaning. 
And these three things are working together when we are reading. And that's basically what the brain does. And so that's why I was sharing with you the hear, see, say, right, right? So we got to, we have, it's all rooted in the phoneme and the ability to connect the phoneme with the, the symbol that's here, the phoneme graphing, we have to be able to connect them and then we have to blend them. And if we can't do that, we can't, we probably won't be able to read the word. Becomes the, why we do this phonemic awareness work as well as the sound symbol correspondence work with the sound spelling card. This is also why we do all the blending work to teach them what do you do when a word is unfamiliar? How do you look at that sequence, put those sequence together to make a word? And then encoding helps us go the other direction, but it also helps with that orthographic mapping. So the blending and the encoding help with the, uh, the say and the write, help us with the orthographic mapping, okay? listen to David Kilpatrick. He, he's going to explain the brain research for us, okay? This is a clip from a longer video, okay? Our sensory system strips the actual look of the letters and the words within one-tenth of a second, sends it to... Um, that's okay. No, it isn't. Okay. So here's, here's, um, here's, a, here's a brain, okay? Not a good drawing of the brain. It's kind of a brain of someone that fell out of building, but so kind of front, front, front to low. This is the front, this is the back, so it's like this. Okay, all right. So what happens, here's our eyes. Uh, visual perception goes to occipital lobes way back here to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, occipital lobes. We get this information, and then it starts down this interesting little path. Within one a tenth of a second, uh, the actual physical look of the, of, the, of the letters gets translated into an abstract visual representation we have of all the letters that got pounded into us in kindergarten first grade, okay? And then just our experience with reading. And then there's this area called the, the, the uh, left fusiform gyrus. And what happens is it stops here first, and, and if it gets a positive ID, not on the look of the word, but on the order of the letters. Is this letter order familiar to me? If the answer is yes, you have instant recognition you can't even suppress. That's how fast it was like you did earlier. So from here to here is, you know, you're, you're right, when you're getting here, you're talking about one, you know, under a third of a second, you've got all you need. And then it's sending the information here to, wow, this is a really distorted brain. And it's to your, to kind of your speech center here and you're going to pronounce it. You don't pronounce it in one point of a second, but you, all right. Then you don't know it. So suddenly it travels up to this area here, higher up in the uh, occipital, occipital temporal area. And you start doing your letter sound type of, uh, type of work on that, okay? So we have an abstract representation of all the letters. So what are we remembering? We are not remembering a visual look of the word. We are remembering the precise letter order, and that's what the, uh, uh, the fusiform gyrus does for us. So consider all the fonts we see, personal handwriting, we glide among them and between them with no problem. We don't have a visual memory for 25 different fonts of every single word. We just don't. So it's not visual memory. So printed words are read instantly about the service sort of based on orthographic memory, not visual memory. You're probably like, okay, cool. Hmm. Uh, what exactly is orthographic memory? And that's how we're going to, that is how we are going to now have a, in a sense, a breakthrough in our understanding and how that interacts with the, with the intervention research. So orthographic mapping, I have to go real fast through this. It's the mental process we use to store words for instant retrieval. I've kind of defined that. It's how we turn unfamiliar words into familiar words. And it's the mechanism for building the cyber because is every fun or what? It's pretty good. But the bottom line is weak readers are inefficient orthographic mappers. Weak readers are in it. Now, they may be inefficient phonic decoders, too. But that's a different level of the process. Remember those three levels? Letter sound knowledge, phonic decoding, orthographic learning, fast, efficient orthographic learning. Kids with the phonological core deficit, by the way, have problems with all three. You've all learned for years. Research says how quickly you pick up assuming opportunity, which you can't always assume. Assuming opportunity, kids who pick up very slowly on letter names and letter sounds in kindergarten are going to be the weak readers. Why? Our intuition says because you need letters to say words or whatever, that intuition is totally correct. But there's another layer to it. The layer is that early it's telling us that this kid probably has some phonological issues because phonology is all about learning those letter names and letter sounds. So in a sense, having a hard time picking up letter names and letter sounds is a marker for the phonological core deficit. And it's going to tell you that the rest of the steps of this are going to be difficult. So that's why letter name, letter sound knowledge early on is a great predictor. It's one of the reasons. So I want to introduce another concept is uh, phonemic proficiency. 
This is, I think, where we've kind of been missing the boat nationally or internationally, really. So phonological awareness, we think of that, we think of these different kinds of tasks. There are multiple tasks involved. We've got, uh, you know, rhyming, alliteration, segmentation, blending, isolation, identification, categorization, blah, blah, blah. Um, all of those correlate with reading, interestingly. It doesn't matter what, it's, because phonology is so important for word reading, it doesn't matter what you throw at kids, it has to do with phonology, it correlates, at least in the early, at least in the early stages. So everyone agrees it's important. But there's a hazy relationship with reading development. If we were to sit and talk among all of us, exactly, exactly how does phonological awareness influence reading? We have an interesting conversation. Most people simply attribute it to, oh, it has something to do with learning phonics. That's true, but that's, that's very limited. That's, uh, phonemic proficiency, however, has a very clear, detailed relationship with that whole reading process that I talked about. It ties in with our theories of word reading development. How do we do orthographic mapping? How does that happen? Phonological proficiency helps explain that. So it's sort of is the holy grail of understanding how we store words, this phonological proficiency thing, phonemic proficiency, I should say, and intervention studies that develop phonemic proficiency had the best results independently of this. In other words, they weren't studying phonemic proficiency. They weren't studying orthographic mapping. They were studying various intervention approaches, and they had the best results, the ones that developed phonological proficiency, unknown to them, which is really exciting, the convergence among the, the theory, the practice, and the intervention. So broadly speaking, phonemic proficiency represents how much phonological awareness slash phonemic awareness you need to be the reader, very broadly speaking. More precisely, it means how instantly and automatically you have access to the phonemic segments of words. Do you, are you able to access the phonemes within words without even thinking about it? Is it precognitive? You saw the word reading is precognitive. You understand that concept now, right? All right, let me tell you about good readers by second grade. Late second grade. Good reader by late second grade, you're going to give them a list of words. You're going to say, test of word reading efficiency starts easy, gets harder. Same as fast as you can. These kids going very quickly. But you know what's exciting? By second grade, most kids, you can give the phonemic decoding part, the phonological decoding part, but they have nonsense words. These children will read single syllable nonsense words virtually instantly. They see blat and they say blat. Okay. All right. To do that, let's see. Let's see. Let's see a word like the uh, black child says it. What do they need to do to say black in under a second? They need to go fetch the letter sound relationship of the B, right? That they're looking at, and then the L, and then the A, and then the T, and then they blend them all together, all in under half a second. They, the response time they can't come out fast enough. Their speech isn't fast enough to respond as quickly as the processing that already happened. That's pretty good. That's letter sound proficiency, right? This is what he was talking about. Orthographically mapped words are precognitive, right? You can't help yourself but read them. So what color is this? Yellow. Blue. Uh, yeah, okay, what color is this? Red. It's red. But what do you read? Your brain reads yellow, right? So when you read these words, you you can't help but read them because these words are orthographically mapped in your brain. You do it so automatic that you can't help it. So when I said, what's the color? Most of us will say blue and then you would wait, it's yellow, right? Because you have to slow yourself down and pay attention to it. So this is an example of orthographically mapped words. So this is why it appears to us that we are reading words as whole words, because as proficient readers, they're orthographically mapped, right? But for children that don't have this orthographically mapped, they do not see the whole word. They, they have to do the individual sounds, right? The sequence of letters blend them together to produce the word. The problem is, is that we're proficient readers. <laughs> so here's some more for you to practice to challenge your brain with. We can't help ourselves. Summarize, there's two things we're working on with our students, right? The decoding skills, so that is what do you do when you identify, you come across an unfamiliar word? How can I under, identify that word, right? They need the skills to do that. But the other half of what we need to develop with them is permanent word storage. And that is helping them orthographically map so that they have automatic word recognition. The thing is, is both of these, and we need both, like with those pictures from Hawaii, you had to go from here to here. You had to do both 
driven by our phonological skills, our phonemic skills, and our sound spelling correspondence. And that's why I've been emphasizing those skills with you, because if we don't have those, it's not possible for them to do these two things and then consequently lift words off the page. Just thought I'd show you different ways people orthographically map, okay? Just so you can see it. This is probably the most common, all right? And so, but basically, but I'll show you other ways to do it too. But basically you're helping students, the point of this, and this starts going to your question about um, sight words, which I'll get in, into in a minute, that you're helping students see the letter sequence and memorize that letter sequence so that the word becomes automatic. And so that's basically what you're doing in orthographic mapping, okay? Um, so again, that's also why we use the blending routines that I shared, I've shared with you. So or, sore, what's the word? Sore, right? Or, or, fork, what's the word? Fork, but by me doing it this way, and you can do it on a whiteboard too, but I'm reinforcing that letter sequence and I'm reinforcing that phoneme grapheme connection and helping them see that OR goes together, right? Or, cord, cord. What's the word? Cord. And then same thing with the right. So the word is corn. What are the sounds in corn? Corn, corn, right? What's the first sound? What's the second sound? Or, what's the third sound? Mm. So doing this very systematic decoding and encoding helps lead not only with blending, but it will help build orthographic mapping. So we're going to talk now about what about the irregular words. So basically 50% of all words are accurate by sound symbol correspondence. And then about 36% more have one sound that's different. That's maybe irregular. Um, and then 4% are, it's not on here, but about 4% are truly irregular and the rest are based on language. So it's like a French word, so that's why. Um, so that's basically, so that's why this becomes so critical. So with irregular words, we need them to orthographically map them. So your question was, I think there was a question about memorizing whole words what we really want to be doing with irregular words is orthographically mapping them with students and teaching them to see that. And so I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Okay, so let me just define some terms. So a sight word is any word that we read by sight. So that means it is orthographically mapped in our brain and we can read it without effort. So as adults, you have 50,000 or more sight words. So when you see the word, you know what it is. Every word on this page you have as a sight word because you read them without effort. A high frequency word, these are words that are the most common in the English language. And they can be regular or irregular. So some are decodable, some are not. And we tend to confuse these three categories in our language and what we're doing with students. But the high frequency word, it can be called a high frequency word sometimes, be, even though it's decodable, the programs will say that it's not decodable because that sound spelling card hasn't been taught. So it gets complicated. <laughs> but by second grade and beyond when all the, the graphemes have been introduced, that shouldn't become an issue, but they kind of move around. An irregular word is a word that doesn't follow regular sound spelling patterns. The way that we introduce 
a high frequency word is very explicit. There is a routine um, and most people don't know this routine, but that's the read spell write routine, which is mapped out right here. Okay, so if you notice it, what it's trying to do, it doesn't call it out. So you have to connect it with the brain research. Okay, it's trying to help kids orthographically map it. That's basically what it's trying to do in this routine. Okay, and so the basic routine is if you read right here, what's the first sound you hear and said? And here's where it's surprising, right? Okay. Then they go to the end sound. Then they go to the middle. Right? Most people just put the whole word up. Um, so it's what's the first sound and said? What's the last sound and said? And then what's the middle sound? And eh. And then you show them if they have not, if it's so if they have not learned it, you just tell them this E by itself makes the E sound, right? If it's irregular, you do the same thing. So this is an irregular word and we need to remember this. Okay, does that help answer that question? You just tell them what. So this is where, so I know some of you are working with people that are in the science of reading group right on Facebook and are very interested in this. So this is where the heart words come in. And the heart words are words that you have to learn by heart. But what you really need to be doing, it's not about the heart, it's about orthographically mapping it with students and letting them see the letter sequence. So for the word said, what you're doing is you're explicitly teaching them that the AI is irregular and so it basically says the S sound, right? So when I'm doing heart words, I would use that same routine. What the word is said, S, what's the sound? S, what's the letter S? S? What's the last sound? D, what's the letter D, right? And now what's the middle sound? S, eh. Now with the word said, we spell it with AI. But notice how I'm doing this. That's going to help a child orthographically map that irregular pattern. So this is why memorization isn't really necessarily the best approach because the brain learns it by letter sequence. So we wanna map out the letter sequence so the brain can orthographically map it and recognize that letter sequence and then have automaticity with the word set. We really need them explicitly teaching, here's, here are the sounds in the word, here's how it's written and work with them on orthographically mapping them. So I'm just showing you different ways people are doing it, if it's helpful for you. And, and you do not have to do heart words. So I know some people are gonna say like, well, you have to do heart words. No, you don't have to do heart words. What you need to do is orthographically map the words. The heart words is just a strategy, right? That you can use. I don't think it's gonna harm anybody, right? If it helps children, you know, but it's a strategy. The, the research is about, you've got to orthographically map the, high, the um, irregular words for students, because that's really where we're going. So here's a bunch of resources for you, for those of you that like to be nerdy like me. So I wanted just to connect back to our top five. And I started with the pedagogy, but today I got into the why behind the pedagogy. Um, and thank you for trusting me in the journey, but now I'm gonna give you why did we pick these top five, right? So clearly correct pronunciation is gonna be critical because everything is rooted in phonemes and phonology, right? The sequence matters. And that here, see, say, write routine, which I know some of you are, are rap really working with your teams on that because that's gonna help with the decoding skill, but it's also gonna help them orthographically map. The routines do the same thing. And then this interaction and high quality practice will lead to the inter um, orthographic mapping. And then small group instruction. So we're diagnosing you know, exactly what students are not, can do and are not able to do so that we can address that. So just kind of in summary, um, word bubble reading, 
is phonological. It doesn't make sense, but that is how it works. And visual memory is not, does not really help us. Okay, so we wanna to work towards orthographic mapping. It will then appear to be visual memory, but it's not really. We wanna make sure that we work on decoding, but the orthographic mapping, both are critical and both are rooted in phonemic awareness and phonology, right? Um, fluency will come with that, but the more that we develop these things and we can prevent the reading, okay? And so the most important things we need to do is advanced phonemic awareness. Don't just do the basic stuff. And some of that doesn't show up until first grade, right? And by the end of first grade, a lot of people leave that out. But the advanced phonemic awareness skills are truly where that portion of the brain is developed. So that's like phoneme replacement, phoneme manipulation, moving things around, right? Change the first sound to the end sound, flip them around, right? All that stuff. The kids need that advanced stuff and they need all the phonemic awareness skills. That is why wonders see, um, um, circles through them. Every day there's another skill that they're revisiting. They have to have that letter sound correspondence and they need lots of opportunities to map this and own it. And so that is um, basically the, a, a quick summary of the science of reading. <laughs>